Okay, let's uh, let's get started. Uh, just as a, the car had a driver. Let's uh, get started. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Just a reminder that this is now a device-free zone. Um, welcome back. I'm sorry to start us off with some uh, morbid news. Some of you may have heard that there was the first uh, human fatality from an autonomous car yesterday. We were just looking into the details uh, of the article. Anyone pick up a physical New York Times this morning? I'm assuming it was on the front page. I don't know if it was the lead article. We're going to have a brief section on robot ethics towards the end uh, of the semester, but I thought this would be a good time to talk about it. Anyone have a chance to read the article, see the details? There, there, was a, there was someone actually in the car, right? And what about the human pedestrian? I didn't see anything like that. Okay. She was just walking. She was like, not in the crosswalk. She was not in the crosswalk. Yeah. Okay. Not Jesus. Okay, of course. Of course. So that's unfortunately the first human fatality made the front page of the New York Times. What do you think is going to happen with the second human fatality? <laughs> Front page, maybe, maybe not. Be interesting to see how society deals with the fact that autonomous cars kill people and non-autonomous cars obviously kill people uh, as well. But somehow it's different when it's a machine, right? Why? Why is that? Okay. I will just leave that as as food for thought. As I mentioned later in the semester, we'll come back to uh, the ethics of AI and robotics, but as students of AI and robotics uh, required homework for today is to have a look at the article and see exactly what, what happened. Okay, back to evolutionary robotics. Uh, just to reorient ourselves to where we are and where we're going. We are working our way through the uh, open challenges in the field of evolutionary robotics. It's a young field. There's a lot of big issues that still no one has a good answer to. And we uh, are working our way through responses to a particular open challenge in evolutionary robotics, which is that usually we evolve behaviors for robots uh, in simulation and then transfer them to uh, reality, and usually the robots fall flat, right? They don't transfer from simulation to reality 99 out of 100 times. Why not? You're all becoming experts on physics engines now. Well, um, so, um, just that there are a lot more like, factors in real life than there are in Exactly. So whatever physics engine we use to evolve behaviors for our robots, it's never going to be a perfect reflection of reality, right? Reality is always going to be more complicated than our virtual worlds. Um, there's artifacts in physics engines that may be trying to replicate actual physical properties, but do so in a way that the AI can take advantage of. Exactly. So that's the second reason, right? First reason is that physics engines are simpler than the real world, so things don't transfer well. And there are also things in physics engines that are different from the real world, right? Physics engines are trying to approximate real physics, and they do it in different ways. And evolution, regardless of whether it's biological evolution or real evo biological evolution or artificial evolution, is a great exploiter, right? Anything that's there, evolution will try and take advantage of it. So it might latch on to or exploit some detail in the physics engine, and that hack doesn't exist in the real world. So again, the real world robot falls, falls flat. Okay, so um, a number of uh, approaches have been proposed in the literature to try and deal with this. We looked at the simplest one last time in lecture 15, which is basically add noise to as many aspects of the physics engine uh, as possible so that evolution cannot lock on to any inaccuracies or approximations uh, in the simulator. So put noise everywhere and also try and use as simple a simulator as possible. So there are as few of these inaccuracies uh, as possible. A good first start, but obviously it leaves much to be desired. Um, so we started last time by looking at a second attempt to deal with this, which was the Golem Project. Um, so I'll jump back to the Golem Project uh, in a moment, but just let's talk about assignments for a moment. 
So hopefully most of you finished and submitted assignment eight, where you were taking a break from developing this sequence of increasingly powerful evolutionary algorithms to get rid of the scissor bot and replace it with the, the quadruped, right? So now that you've got the quadruped, you're gonna continue on with the quadruped and in assignment uh, nine, you're going to be implementing the next in the series of evolutionary algorithms, which is the uh, genetic algorithm. That's assignment nine. Any questions about assignments? Grad students, final projects? All good? Yes, question. So on sure. The final project, the, I was looking for a place to upload the third part, the third. Uh, the third weekly report? Yeah, I didn't see it. It's not there because I haven't added it yet. So okay. I will add it after class. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the reminder. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, so we're all on track. So uh, back to the Golem project and back to the New York Times, I guess, right? Um, so back in 2000, the Golem project uh, was uh, published in Nature magazine. There was a lot of uh, public press interest in this because this was the first example of robots making robots making robots, which is again an idea that's been around since the late 1940s. Um, John von Neumann proposed this idea of von Neumann machines, which were machines that could make copies uh, of themselves. What was reported in the Golem project was not actually von Neumann machine, but rather evolving robots in simulation and hooking them up to this brand new whiz-bang technology called 3D printers. Right? So uh, we started on this last time. The Golem project is made up of these three experimental phases. Phase one is going to look very, very uh, familiar to you. So again, evolve a robot uh, in simulation. These robots are made up of bars attached together with these sphere spherical joints. So each ball in the robot there, you can think of that as a ball and socket joint like your shoulder. Um, it's passive. There's no motors at the ball and socket joint. But some of these bars are broken into linear actuators. So some of them are pistons, like you can see in this little cartoon here, which can compress or extend the length of the, the bar. So a slightly different morphology from what we've seen before, but same basic idea, right? We're gonna evolve con neural controllers for these robots along with their bodies. And then in step two, we're gonna take these robots and manufacture them with a 3D printer. Um, back in 2000, the 3D printers could only print thermal plastics. So we're gonna print the plastic skeleton or the shell of the robot and snap in all the metals and ceramics and batteries and sensors uh, and motors. This is an ongoing research project to try and place all of the components of a robot, uh, or make, make all the components of a robot manufacturable. And we'll come back to that towards the end of this lecture. Okay, that's the basic idea. Um, I think we ended last time by looking at how the genotypes for these robots are encoded. Um, we've seen different ways of doing this. We've seen uh, vectors of numbers where each element in the vector corresponds to the weight of one synapse. We saw genetic programming where the genotype was a tree. Um, now we're looking at a genotype which is a list of lists. So the overall list is made up of four sublists, and each of those four sublists encodes information about the four different subsystems uh, of the robot. The vertices, which is where these ball and socket joints are, the bars that connect the ball and socket joints together, neurons, and then actuators, um, which connect, uh, which allow the robot to, to move. Okay, so um, the list of vertices itself is made up of a list of triplets indicating the XYZ coordinates of each vertex of the robot. Bars are made up of uh, vectors of length four, which, ve which vertex is connected to which other vertex, and then we have a relaxed length and a stiffness. What does that mean? You've seen that before a couple lectures back. Why would a bar have a relaxed length and a stiffness? Are they acting like springs? There are springs in there. So it doesn't say it explicitly, but some of the bars, when they're broken into these linear actuators, there is actually a spring inside. So imagine you have a piston, one large bar and one thin bar um, that are moving back and forth, and they are attached with a spring, they have a resting length, and that spring has a stiffness attached with it, right? How strong the spring is. 
the actuator inside the bar pulls and pushes on the spring. So you actually have an actuator, springs, and this bar, the physical bar itself, all composed uh, into one unit connecting two of these vertices uh, together. Okay. Then we have neurons, with, uh, which are pretty familiar to us. We have a threshold. Remember the activation function. So each neuron receives some raw sum of input from all the values of the incoming neurons multiplied by the synaptic weights that connect them. We sum up that. We uh, compute that raw sum. If that raw sum is above some threshold, the neuron sends out its own value. Otherwise, the neuron is silent. Um, and we're going to assume that every time we add a neuron to the robot's brain, we're going to connect it by synapses to all the other neurons. So we're not we don't have a uh, we don't have an explicit sublist for synaptic weights. They're implied by the, the neurons. Okay. We have all of these bars, and then some of these bars have actuators attached to them. So every bar that has an actuator attached to it, that bar is cut in half. We put a spring in it, and then we attach the actuator to the, the spring. So some bars are just fixed length bars, and others are actuated linear actuators. Okay. Concept that we haven't really talked about too much yet, but it's a good one to know, is we've now described the genotype. And you can imagine how you take this genotype and construct the phenotype that you see on the right. And the phenotype is the robot's body uh, and brain. This might be a direct genotype to phenotype mapping or an indirect genotype to phenotype mapping. So the direct ones are ones in which you look at the genotype, you look at the blueprint, and any single number in that genotype corresponds to one and only one part of the phenotype. An indirect mapping is one in which, as the name implies, there's sort of an indirect connection here. So any one number in the genotype may correspond to zero, one, or more than one element of the phenotype. So is this genotype to phenotype mapping a direct encoding or an indirect encoding? <coughs> Seems like a direct encoding. Does any one number here corresponds to one part of the, the phenotype? I wanted to just make this distinction up front because as we move towards the end of the course, we're going to see more and more sophisticated, more and more sophisticated genotype to phenotype mappings. And most of the ones we're going to see towards the end of the course are indirect. So making one change, one mutation that changes one number in the genotype may have little, no impact or a small impact or a very large impact on the, the phenotype. Okay, we'll come back to that uh, later. Okay, so now we know what the genomes uh, look like. What does the evolutionary process look like? Well, we're actually going to start with an initial population, not of random robots, but of null genotypes. So what's a null genotype? Well, the overall uh, list is going to be empty to start with. We're going to have null robots. The fitness is pretty much what we've always seen. We're going to evaluate the robots in a physics engine for a fixed period of time and compute their displacement. The further they move, the more fit uh, they are. And in the paper, they report the evaluation period not as the number of time steps in the simulation, but the number, fixed number of cycles of its neural controller, and I put a question mark there because it's a little unclear by that description what they mean, but they mention cycles, so that means that the neural controller is going to have to oscillate 12 times. So that's a hint, and again, they didn't mention this explicitly in the paper, but some of these neurons are actually special neurons that emit an oscillatory signal. What are those special neurons called? We've seen them before a couple times now. CPGs, right? You have them in your spine. They help you generate an oscillatory signal. So there's some CPGs in there, and those CPGs are going to output an oscillatory signal that some of the other neurons are going to listen to, and that signal is going to oscillate 12 times, and that's the evaluation period of each individual robot. OK. Okay, so now we know what the genome looks like. We have a basic idea of the evolutionary process. How do mutations occur uh, in this process? 
Well, every time, uh, every time a genotype is copied and a mutation is introduced, there are uh, 10 different kinds of mutations that can occur. And these mutations make a change to the list of lists, and they have different impacts. So with a 10% probability, a mutation is made that changes the length of a bar. A bar gets longer or shorter. Um, a synapse may be chosen, and its weight may be changed with 10% probability. They may add or remove a dangling bar from one of the vertices. Uh, they may add or remove an unconnected uh, neuron, so the brain of the robot gets a little bit bigger by one neuron. They can split a vertex into two, and those two vertices are connected with a small bar, number seven. Number eight, split a bar into two and add a vertex in the middle. Attach or detach a neuron to a bar. The moment that a neuron is connected to a bar, like we see here, that bar suddenly splits in two, a spring gets added, and an actuator gets added to the, the spring. So attaching a neuron to a bar turns that bar into a linear actuator. Okay, so just to build up a little bit of an intuition for how these mutation operators work, here is a series of one, two, three, four, five, six mutations, one after the other, that start with a null phenotype, a no robot. And after the mutation, we have this robot. After this mutation, we have this robot. After this mutation, we have this robot, and so on. So I want you to turn to your neighbor and figure out which of these mutations from the list of 10 up there are changing one phenotype into the next. So which of the 10 mutations turned the null robot into this robot? Let's start with that one all together. Which one is it? <coughs> Change the length of a bar, right? So it's a little bit cheating here. There's a bar of length zero, and it gets lengthened a little bit, right? So mutation number one is the first mutation. OK, turn to your neighbor and see if you can figure out the other five mutations. Give you a couple minutes for that, and then we'll see what you came up with. Okay, it's not as easy as it looks. Not all science, not all scientists are accomplished artists, so uh, we'll do our best here. Okay, let's start with this mutation. This one's easy. Which one is it? Number one, right? Change the length of a bar. Okay, that one's easy. How about this one? 
there's actually more than one mutation here, right? Again, there's a little bit of an accuracy here. Number five and one. Number five and one, right? So change the length of the bar, obviously, and five, add an unconnected neuron. So it's unconnected to any other neurons, because there aren't any other neurons. Change the length of the bar again, and, and a five again, and it also that's it. So it adds an unconnected neuron, which is this neuron here, which is unconnected to any other neurons. But whenever we add a new neuron, the other neurons attach to it. So again, this is something you kind of have to infer from the cartoon here, right? Okay. How about this one? Is that seven the split of vertex? And then some, it, it also adds a synaptic. Or like or adds a recurrent connection. I didn't really see it. Yeah, exactly. It's a little unclear, right? So let's look at the body for a moment. So it's definitely number seven. Split this vertex into two and add a small bar, right? And then, again, I'm not sure, but I think it's number two. Change a synaptic weight. So I think they're assuming that there's a weight here of weight zero, and they change the weight. But... Again, a little, little ambiguous, but <clears throat> hopefully we're getting the idea here. What about this one? Yep. Number nine, right? So attach a neuron, this neuron, to this bar, which now becomes an actuated piston. And eight, split bar into two and add vertex. I think it's implied that, w I think this little picture here indicates that it's just the piston. It's not splitting it into two. Again, it's a little ambiguous. Okay, here are my guesses. They're pretty close to, I think, what, with what you came up with. I already see a few mistakes in my answers, so there you go. Okay, <laughs> I think you get the idea. Okay, so uh, on to the fun part. What actually evolved? Here's an example of uh, samples from one generation. So this is one evolutionary run. And they took a given generation, I don't know if it actually says here, and they cut through the population. So you get a feel for the diversity in the population. You can obviously see here that some of these are related to one another, and others are quite, quite different. So there's some diversity in the population, at least in this run at that generation. Here's now samples from one evolutionary run. So the, the one in the top left there, um, that was the best individual in generation number uh, four. In this panel, this was the best robot in the population at generation 13, 26, 27, and so on up to generation 198. So now we're not looking crosswise across the population in a given generation. We're looking lengthwise over evolutionary time at the best individuals in the population at certain generations. Okay, just giving you a feel for what's going on inside these populations. There's a, a series of nice visualizations in this paper, which again, may be an interesting tool for you in your final project. These are phylogenetic trees. If you've ever taken a biology course, you've probably seen something that looks like this. So what are we looking at? Well, in each one of these panels, as we march down the panel, we're moving forward in evolutionary time from one generation to the next. And the horizontal axis indicates ancestral proximity. What does that mean? That means in general, but not in every case here, if we take two points in this plot, those points correspond to individuals. And the further apart they are horizontally, the less related they are. The closer they are horizontally, the more related they are. And what do we mean by less and more related? It means how far do we have to go back in the evolutionary history to find a common ancestor for both? So if we look at, for example, panel D here, we can see there are these three individuals, um, and they're somewhat separate from one another horizontally here. They should probably be a little bit closer. These three individuals are uh, siblings because they have their a common parent. Further down in the tree here, some of these individuals are first cousins, second cousins, and so on, right? The further down and apart from one another you are in the tree, the further back up the tree you have to go to find a common ancestor. Make sense? 
Okay, one of the nice things about plotting your evolving populations in this way is you can easily see certain evolutionary events occurring in your population. So for example, in plot A here, we can see that there is diversity. So we have at the end of evolutionary time here, at the bottom of the plot, we have lots of different individuals that ha we have to go quite a far way back in the tree to find a common ancestor. They're all quite different. So that's a pretty successful evolutionary run in that we have a lot of diversity in the population. In panel B, we have the opposite case. If you look upward, you'll see that pretty much there was one common ancestor up there from which everyone else is descended. And as we move down the tree, it tapers off more and more and more, meaning we, we have more and more siblings. They die off. They have siblings. They have siblings and so on. Everyone is very related to one another, and we have very little uh, diversity at the end of the evolutionary run. Panel C is nice because we can see there clearly these two groupings. So we have two different species, two different gro groups of robots. And in panel D here, uh, we have the dinosaurs that were doing wonderfully for a while, but there were these three small mammals running around and surviving in the population for a long time. They didn't produce any offspring, or at least maybe they produced one to replace themselves. But eventually, they started to produce a few offspring that did better than the dinosaurs and better and better until we end up with mammals at the, at the end. So we can clearly see a large-scale extinction event going on in this evolving population. Okay, again, a nice tool that you might want to use for your uh, final project. Aside from the fact that we can see evolutionary dynamics going on, there's another reason why this is useful. At the end, for example, in this evolutionary run, we have two groups of robots. Perhaps this group will not transfer to reality well, but maybe this group will. Right? If we end up with robots that are all the same, if we end up with robots that are all the same, and one of them doesn't transfer to reality, we're in trouble, right? Because probably the others won't transfer as well. So one part of the solution to the reality gap problem is going to have to be diversity. Diversity is necessary. It's not sufficient. But it would be good to have lots of different kinds of robots and that some of them might be able to transfer to reality. And we'll see that in uh, two lectures' time, the impact of diversity on our ability to transfer from simulation to reality. OK. OK, let's have a look at some of these actual robots now. Let's see if I can play these in parallel. I can. OK, so two related individuals from two separate evolutionary runs. What kinds of strategies is evolution discovering here? A little bit of inchworm. It's not peristalsis, which we've seen a lot of times, but it's kind of related to it, right? Pretty simple behaviors. No bipeds here, no sophisticated forms of locomotion. How do you think these designs are going to transfer to reality? When we 3D print them in a moment, how are they going to do? I see a lot of shakes of the head. Why not? They kind of flail around. So they're not very good even in simulation. There's a few other hints here. Remember, this is 2000. Physics engines were not very accurate back then. Well, it looks like friction is pretty important at the top. Like it sort of relies on the fun part grabbing the ground and the tail not being like too heavy to that's it. So you can see there's a lot of dragging going on, right? In some cases, there's pushing to try and counteract uh, gravity, but there is sort of a lot of pushing and pulling and dragging. So friction is going to be particularly important here, right? This is not bipedal locomotion over ice where you're trying to minimize the amount of sliding, right? You can step very carefully and minimize uh, horizontal movement due to friction, in which case maybe friction doesn't matter too much. Right? But here these things are dragging all over the place. We better hope that the friction model in this physics engine is pretty accurate. What else can you tell me? There's a couple other hints in these videos about how well or how not so well these are going to transfer to reality. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So the the collision detection and resolution part of these physics engines <clears throat> isn't so great, right? A lot of these objects are interpenetrating, which we know is not going to happen in, in reality. Okay. Not looking good so far. Okay. okay, just a few more designs. You get a sort of feel for what kinds of designs appear. Is there a common strategy among these? Exactly, right? So there's, there's some piston in here where it's trying to get somewhat vertical and push, lift a little bit, pull forward. We'll see. Okay. Oops. Okay. So here are three evolved designs, and these were chosen because they had interesting properties or they had uh, much higher fitness than the other designs, and they were transferred to reality. And there's the stats. How did these three machines do? First two, not so good. The head, exactly. 0.1 centimeter, so a millimeter off. Not too bad, right? One out of three ain't bad when you're trying to cross the reality gap. OK, let's have a look at these designs in simulation and then in reality, and can we build up an intuition for why some of them transferred well to reality and some not so well? So let's have a look at the arrow first of all. Somewhat bilaterally symmetric, perhaps just by chance. All of the white material that you can see, that's thermoplastic, so that's the part that was printed with the 3D printer. Everything else was slotted in uh, by hand. Pusher, not a very descriptive name for this one. Not going to win any land speed records, but... Why does the tetrahedron do so much better than the other two? Doesn't have long dragging parts in the back. Okay, it doesn't have long dragging parts, so uh, maybe that makes a difference. Maybe. It looks like it has the least amount of friction, so the physics engine is like more energy amount of friction. Friction is more. Exactly. It's hard to tell just by visual inspection, but it looks like most of the pushing is more vertical and there's more lift than in the other, the other machines. Maybe. As usual, it's very hard for us to tell, right? The reason why we're using evolutionary optimization is because we wanted to deal with this non-intuitive design space, right? So it's not immediately clear. There are no hard and fast rules, or at least no one's been able to come up with any hard and fast rules yet about what transfers well from simulation to reality. Okay. Some do, some don't in the Golem project. Okay. So um, that's step one. So evolving in simulation and then step two, manufacturing these robots using a 3D printer, uh, which was extremely exciting at the time. Here's a sped up video of it printing one of these bars. Um, and then these bars were snapped uh, together. Um, this particular 3D printer actually could print out pretty much the entire robot shell. And this thin material that you see here, this is just support material to help the 3D printer to create these arbitrary 3D geometries. They put this in a chemical bath overnight and it would gradually dissolve away the support material and leave just the, just the robot. I mentioned that these vertices are turned into ball and socket joints. So one of the fun things about 3D printers is figuring out these geometries that allow this 
uh, to happen. So they were able to print the ball in the internal socket all together rather than, rather than having to uh, print them as separate parts and then snap them, snap them together. Okay. Um, just a little bit about the Golem project. Very exciting at the time. Uh, the researchers who worked on this are continuing to work on this. Um, they've moved on to printing just the plastic of the robot. They can now print 3D print uh, batteries. So you need to be able to print metals and ceramics uh, together to print a battery. That battery has one, you know, one millionth the capacity of a AA battery, but it's a start, right? It's all automatic. Um, they're able to print actuators. So there's some exotic materials that when you pass a current through them, they deform their shape. So you can actually print not a motor, but an actuator, something that moves when you supply a current to it. Again, it's not a very strong motor, or it's not a very strong actuator. It's not a very fast actuator, but it's a start. Um, they've been able to 3D print uh, a flashlight, so something that has all the working electronics and the light, uh, the light emitter itself. So the overall goal for these researchers is to print, eventually print a robot that can walk out of the 3D printer. Not there yet, but they're getting very close. Okay. Okay. One of the nice things about printing a robot that's mostly plastic is we can melt it down. Eventually melt it down. Collect all the thermoplastic and print another one. And use a very sophisticated 3D printer that grows the 3D plastic, the 3D uh, thermoplastic. Not quite, okay. Even a few scientists have a sense of humor, okay. Okay, I think in the interest of time, I'm not going to play the video, but you can go back and watch, um, you can watch this video. This is the Fab at Home project, which is sort of a follow-up project to uh, the Golem project. So back in the 1980s, there were these kits you could buy and you could actually construct a simple computer at home. It was the beginning of the home computer revolution. It actually started from kits. So in the same way, in the early 2000s, they came out with this idea of Fab at Home, where you could download the instructions and all the simple part and buy all the simple parts to actually build your own uh, desktop 3D printer. At the same time that this was going on at Cornell here in the US, um, in the UK, there was the RepRap project, which was not just instructions about how to order and build your own 3D printer, but it was a special 3D printer that could make most, but not all, of its own parts. So not quite a von Neumann machine, a machine that makes a copy of itself, but a machine that pretty much can print all the parts of itself that a human can come in and construct. Okay, so you can imagine where the goal of these projects is going, which is a full von Neumann machine, a 3D printer that could print, a 3D printer with legs that could walk out of the 3D printer and print another 3D printer with legs that would walk out of the 3D printer and ad infinitum. Okay, just for fun, yes? I'm just curious why they are printing batteries. I mean, it seems like the batteries are handmade in little artisanal yep. studios, but why, why 3D print them if they're so much worse than, you know, just are already working on it? Why, do you, why, right, why 3D print a battery or 3D print a circuit if there are perfectly good batteries and perfectly good circuits out there? <coughs> why bother? You want to make a perfect von Neumann machine. So we hook up our 3D printer to the internet and it orders AA batteries from Amazon and they get delivered to the 3D printer's front door. How do you get it the last little bit, right? You need a human in the loop to deliver the batteries or plug them in to the machine. That. You could maybe you could automate it. We've got drones now, right? So we could probably figure out how to jerry-rig such a thing, right? The reason they want to 3D print it is because they want a robot that walks out of the 3D printer. And the robot that walks out of the 3D printer eventually might itself be a 3D printer. Could they not place like a battery on the printing surface and print the machine? They could place a battery on the printing surface. Who is they? Like, like initially, 
the proboscis. Okay. Places a battery on the printing surface, prints it. That prints the machine that could place it, like an, another battery or its own battery on the surface. Possibly, right? So actually, in terms of self-replicating machines, there is a literature on, a, on this, and we only have one lecture to talk about it. They ask those kinds of questions. If you wanted to be able to create a machine that makes a copy of itself, Humans might be in the loop. They might be there to start set the initial conditions, and from there, the machines might be able to, to take over. Could you fully automate this process? Would you want to fully automate this process, which comes back to robot ethics? See a lot of people shaking their heads, probably not yet. If you were trying to make a machine that could create copies of itself, would yes. you need like, materials um, as inputs? Why not just view a battery of the other materials until you get to the that's one factory that's making batteries and like that would completely automate that's right. you know, humans in that process. That's it. And then eventually So that's a really good observation. So what you're describing is a gradient, right? Start by putting a battery near the machine and maybe the machine reaches out and grabs the battery and then it needs to go find materials to put them together to make a battery which incorporates into itself <clears throat> and so on, right? We could make it increasingly difficult for the robot to go out and find increasingly more raw materials for what it needs. It also seems like they're trying for such a hard, they're trying for like a multi-step thing. Like they want to make a machine that causes the video video game. Also prints itself like, why not just take one step? Overly <laughs> ambitious, good yeah, point, so yes. Why not, okay. So the Golem project is really the focus of our discussion today, right? Crossing the reality gap. Fab at Home and RepRap are just sort of tangential projects that got started at the beginning of the 3D printing revolution, which happened around 2000. Question, comment. I was just going to say that, like, well, everything has to start out, you know, somewhere. So if they want to get better at, you know, at a certain point, maybe they'll be really good at printing. <coughs> and then they'll be better. And then they'll get better. And then, you know, the batteries will come out. So it's just that you have to work on it from the start to get better. Exactly. So that's a good lead-in question to my question down here. So you now have some experience with evolutionary algorithms. Let's imagine you create an evolutionary algorithm that is evolving not a population of robots, but a population of 3D printers. And this is a thought experiment. So this could be simulated 3D printers or it could be physical 3D printers. Imagine that we start not with a population of random 3D printers, but minimal 3D printers. So very simple 3D printers, 3D printers where we hand the 3D printer the batteries, so we're already giving it its parts. Um, humans are in the loop somehow. How would you evolve these 3D printers? What would your fitness function be? You have a 3D printer which can't print a copy. It can print a copy of itself with help from humans. How would you evolve such a population of 3D printers? The less human involvement, the better the uh... You put a penalty term in the fitness function, which is the number of people, number of people hours, uh, amount of effort on their behalf that they're involved in the process, right? You could try and evolve human intervention out of the replication process. Again, assuming you wanted to do this in the first place. Aside from removing humans from the process, what other aspects of the self-replication process might you want evolution to try and optimize? Um, efficiency to, you know, uh, use of materials and energy efficiency. Absolutely. How long does it take the 3D printer to make a copy of itself? How much raw materials does it use? So even in the Golem project, you can see that some of the material that was 3D printed does not end up in the final product. It gets washed away, right? So you might put in various efficiency uh, metrics. Overall output. Overall output? <coughs> sure, right? Can I print, maybe the 3D printer prints one and that's it, it exhausts its resources. Could it print two? Could it print ten? It would be nice from an intellectual point of view to have a 3D printer that does nothing else either than print a copy of itself, but maybe we would want it to do something once it copies itself, so we might add that to the, the fitness function. So this is, again, just a thought experiment. No one's tried this yet, but could you evolve increasingly efficient von Neumann machines? 
Again, if you decide to do that, please try and do it in simulation. We don't want these physical things running around quite yet. Okay. It has to go and harvest its raw materials, right? How does it do that, right? We all have to take a lunch break and go harvest our own materials as well, right? You're going to have to go forage for, for food. Would we want machines to do that? And if so, how would they go about doing so? <laughs> yes, um, science fiction fans, you've probably heard of the gray goo hypothesis, which is where all of these thought, thought experiments eventually end, but we'll, we'll leave it there. Okay, so that's going from science to science fiction, so that's probably a good sign that it's a good place to pause the Golem Project. Um, We've got 25 minutes left. I apologize I haven't put up the slides for lecture 17 uh, yet, but we'll start in on this lecture nonetheless. So um, again, we're looking at approaches to solving the reality gap problem. We can take a physics engine, we can add noise to it, uh, and try and transfer things from simulation to reality. We can hook 3D printers up to our simulator and just manufacture as many of the evolved robots as possible until we get one or more that does cross the reality gap. This next project we're going to look at is actually something that I worked on uh, about 10 years ago now, and this came to be known as the Resilient Machines Project. And the basic idea in the Resilient Machines Project is let's try and evolve the simulator itself. So if the simulator is always an inaccurate reflection of reality, if we cross the reality gap, and even if we fail to cross the reality gap, even if the robot doesn't do what it was supposed to do, it's going to collect some experience from the real world, send those experiences back to the simulator, and we're going to use that raw material to tune up the accuracy of the simulator so that the next robot we evolve in the improved simulator has a better chance of crossing the reality gap. It's the basic idea. Make sense? Okay, so let's look at that in a little more detail. Okay. I'm gonna just <clears throat> briefly touch on this slide. I use this for lots of other purposes, but it makes sense to use for the Resilient Machines project as well. I think we talked about this at the beginning of the class, right? We know how to build industrial robots that do the same thing over and over again. We don't know how to build robots that adapt to the changing circumstances of the real world. So we can build autonomous machines, but we have a hard time building autonomous and adaptive machines. And that's sort of what this course is all about, right? All the machines we're building, we try and make them adaptive to some degree. But what really do we mean by adaptive, right? The robot could adapt its behavior but there are other things that can adapt, like, for example, adapting the simulator that the physical robot is using to generate controllers for itself. So we're going to adapt not just the neural network controllers of the robots, we're going to also be adapting the physics engine itself. Or if you want to think about this differently, the physical robot is going to adapt the physics engine that it's using to generate controllers for itself. Okay, so um, we're going to go through this project in a fair bit of detail, but again, just to give you the overall picture, here's a robot that we're going to be using in the Resilient Machines project. It's used a physics engine to evolve controllers in simulation first, and then some of those transfer to reality pretty well. So we're not, we don't see the simulation part here, just the end result. Here's one controller that transferred to reality. What happens if something changes with the robot itself? So in this case, we had a grad student go in and pull off part of the robot's leg. So the robot has changed. So you can be sure that the physics engine, the simulation of this robot, no longer matches its reality. It has to adapt the physics engine to reflect this change. It does so, and again, I'm not showing you the details here, but imagine it adapts the physics engine so that it now better reflects its new situation and now evolves a new controller in that, in that updated physics engine and comes up with a different controller. So the controller has changed, but so is the physics engine. Sure. So the, I mean, the physics engine is just the piece of it that 
describes how objects interact with the environment. Correct. Right? Yeah. So I, I guess I'm not quite clear on how removing part of the robot affects the physics engine. That's right. We haven't gone into how removing part of the robot affects the physics engine. We're going to do that in a moment. Just wanted to give you the overall flow of where we're, where we're going. We have a machine which is adaptive in a different way from all the machines we've seen up to this point. We now have a machine which is resilient, and this is where the resilient machines term comes from. It's a machine that when not only its environment changes, but itself changes, becomes damaged in this case, it can adapt and deal with that situation. So resiliency is different from robustness. Robustness is the idea that the world around you is changing. You have a particular way of doing things. You're just going to keep doing it. You might do it faster, stronger than you did it before. You're just going to push through all of the changes that you see around you in the real world. That's robustness. Resiliency is another component of intelligence. Remember our discussion about the building blocks of intelligence. Resiliency is having the intelligence to know that your current way of doing things no longer works and you're going to have to adapt. You're going to have to come up with a new way of doing things because the world, or perhaps yourself, has changed enough that your old way of doing things doesn't work. So how do we do that? It's not quite clear, but our robot here is going to do that by not only adapting controllers, but also adapting the physics engine that it uses to evolve controllers in the first place. Question? Yeah, uh, to get a clearer idea of this process, okay. so is this, like, is this in one lifetime, per se, of the robot? You just turn it on, it walks, pull off its leg, and then it generates a new controller? Uh, it is all, these, all these three videos are taken from one long experiment, and you're asking about the time scale. So maybe it's worthwhile now. We're going to go one level down, and we're going to go through this process again in more detail. Okay. Here we go. Uh, oh, sorry. I forgot. Before we do that, just to, again, situate this particular project in the larger landscape of evolutionary robotics. You've seen quite a few evolutionary robotics experiments by now, and you can probably take each of those experiments and put them into one of three classes. They tend to fall into three different approaches. The first one, which we saw uh, way back with the Kepler robot, is just forget about physics engines altogether, or before physics engines even existed, take your physical robot and evaluate every single controller on the physical robot itself, which has an obvious limitation. First of all, it takes a lot of time. It might require a lot of human intervention. Um, and you're probably going to wear your robot down after all these evaluations. right? So it doesn't make sense for the robot to try out every alternative one after the other. So physics engines were invented, and they were rapidly taken over by roboticists. And then we have this much more common second class of experiments where we have a simulator. We create a simulator of the robot, which is what you just did in assignment eight. And then you're going to do some or all of the controller evolution in simulation and then transfer to reality, um, which is nice because, again, it speeds up this process. We can evaluate millions of controllers in simulation much faster than we could uh, in reality. But this approach also has drawbacks. Um, the first and most obvious one is the reality gap problem, but also you have to spend weeks and weeks making the simulator itself, right? So there's a lot of human effort in creating the simulator itself. So you just finished making the simulation of the quadruped robot. Imagine I said to you, forget about it. Let's not do the quadruped. I've got a biped robot over here. Throw away the quadruped simulation and make a biped simulator, right? It's a lot of effort to make these simulators by hand. A third approach, which we haven't seen too much yet, is try and make the, the beginnings of a controller by hand, difficult thing to do, and then sort of let evolution clean up the controller, improve the controller. It takes over from where the, hum, where the human left off. So all of these three approaches sort of have these drawbacks. Did you have a comment? No? OK. So these three classes. So the Resilient Machines project we're going to look at now introduces a fourth approach, which some have followed since then, which is we're going to take the experiences of the physical robot, feed them back into the evolutionary process. And the evolutionary process is not going to evolve controllers. It's going to evolve populations of simulators. Okay, We call this estimation. 
because the physical robot is trying to estimate or approximate its current situation, right? It's, um, some of the reporters who covered this work refer to this as the Dreaming Robots Project, right? So if you think of the physical robot and it has access to these simulators and the physical robot is evolving a whole bunch of these simulators to get them to better and better approximate its reality, the robot is dreaming or thinking up a description of its current situation. It's estimating its current state. Once it's evolved a simulator, it can take that evolved simulator and do what we've now seen many, many times, which is use that, control, use that simulator and evolve controllers against that simulator. So that's exploration, because the robot is exploring all the different ways that it might move or behave in the physics engine before trying out one of those controllers in reality. It's mentally exploring the space of all things it might be able to do in reality. OK. So uh, aside from the Resilient Machines project, in the technical literature, this is known as the Estimation Exploration Algorithm, or EEA. OK, back to uh, the Resilient Machine itself. So how does this experiment start? The, the remainder of the slides we're going to look at in this lecture are taken from a single evolutionary run. We're just going to keep going all the way through. So we start at the beginning. We already have our physical robot. We start with, like we saw in the Golem project, an empty simulator. And in that empty simulator, we can add these nine parts together. So the robot knows that there are these nine parts, but it does not know how these nine parts are put together. So any given simulator is going to be start with the empty simulator, and the genome is going to dictate how to connect these nine parts together. OK. Before that starts, the physical robot performs a random action. The physical robot, again, it doesn't have a physics engine. So the, the physical robot has no idea what it looks like. It doesn't know that it's radially symmetric. This robot does not have a camera. It can't see itself. The only thing this robot can do is rotate uh, its eight motors in different directions. So in this random action here, it rotates six of the motors upwards and two of them, motor one and five, downward. And I'm just numbering these eight motors to remind us that the physical robot has no idea where these motors are relative to its center. So imagine you're this robot. You're blind, deaf, and dumb. You have very little sensory information. The only sensory information that this robot has is two tilt sensors in the main body. The first tilt sensor reports how much the robot tilts left and right and how much it tilts forward and back. So if you were this robot and you rotated motors one and five down and you tilted to the right, what can you conclude about motors one and five? That they're somewhere on your left. You're not exactly sure where, but you now have a little bit more information about motors one and five. You have no information about the other six. So what does the robot do with that information? The physical robot now starts running this evolutionary algorithm, which is going to search over the space of simulators. Here is one of the uh, initial simulators in this population of simulators. How accurate is that simulator? Great, right? OK. OK, this is going to run pretty quickly, so I'll play it a few times. We're watching a snapshot of the best simulator in the population over a number of generations. So you're watching about, I think it was 20 generations in this case, and you're looking at the one that is most fit in the population. And if you watch carefully, you'll notice that the green box, which is the robot center, tends to rotate forward into the screen. And this is my failures as a cinematographer. I should have placed the camera 90 degrees over there because this green box is actually rotating about 20 degrees to the right, which is exactly what the physical robot did. So the physical robot's main body is tilting about 20 degrees, maybe 30 degrees to the right. So 
What are we evaluating the fitness? Like? Ex exactly. I'm giving you a hint. What is the fitness of any one simulator in this population of simulators? The ability to reproduce the random movement. The ability to produce not the movement, but the sensory data that was generated by the movement, right? The physical robot rotated motors one and five down, and the left-right tilt sensor gave a reading of minus 30 degrees. That's the information that the robot has. It has the motor data, motors one and five, and minus 30 degrees or 30 degrees to the right. It has those two pieces of data. And the fitness of any one controller, and every single simulator, sorry, every single simulator you see here, motors one and five are rotating down, and the other six are rotating up. It's hard to see in this video. That's what's happening. It's, the simulated robot is performing the same action that the physical robot performed. And the fitness is how close is the virtual sensor data to the physical sensor data. The closer the match, the more fit the robot. So you'll notice that actually the last 10 or so of these uh, simulators all have pretty much maximum fitness. They're all rotating 30 degrees to the right. Again, apologies for the camera angle. There's a problem, though. From the physical robot's point of view, there's a problem in that it's getting optimal fitness for a whole bunch of different simulators, which all have different body parts, this, or different body, body plans. This robot doesn't know a lot, but it knows that all of those simulators cannot be right, right? So what would, if you were the physical robot, what would you do next? You've maxed out your fitness. Try moving other parts of the body. Exactly. Do something, do something else. So this is just a visual description of what we just talked about. So the fitness, higher fitness, means a closer match between physical and virtual sensor data. Right, so you need more data, right? So the simulations, evolving the simulations pauses for a moment, and the physical robot does something else. In this case, this. Now our physical robot has two data points, the first action and the first sensory result, and the second action and the sen second sensory result. So now it's going to go back to the, it's gonna go back to the, it's gonna go back to evolving simulators. What is the fitness now? What is the fitness function now? You have one of these simulators. What's the fitness of that simulator? How good it is at the first problem and the second problem? Exactly. So each simulator now is going to be evaluated twice. Once, we're going to supply the first action, virtual data, virtual sensor data, perform the second action, second sensor data, and now uh, the fitness function is more stringent, right? You have to match as close as you can the sensor data for both actions. Okay, so, so far I've shown you physical robot simulator, physical robot simulator. We've done two of these cycles. What you're actually seeing in this video is the eighth cycle. And why did I pick the eighth cycle? Because on the eighth cycle here, the physical robot has performed eight actions, and each simulator is evaluated eight times and has to produce, has to match eight sets of sensor data. And at the beginning of this, of the, the beginning of the eighth cycle, it's clearly still wrong, but suddenly there is an improvement in fitness twice in this run. Partway through this run, it figures out three of the four legs, but the fourth one is still not matching. That parent genome, that parent genome produces a mutation that produced that child, and this child, suddenly it's not perfect. You can see the legs are still bent, but it's matching all eight sets of sensor data pretty well, right? So it's starting to home in on an understanding of self without access to a camera or anything else, right? It's inferring how it's put together. Okay, this is a snapshot of the 16th action. So still one long evolutionary run. We're going back and forth from reality to simulation. Performs this action, and now when it goes back to its population of simulators. These are what the simulators look like. 
If you were the robot, what would you do at this point? You're done, right? You have a pretty good, you've collected eight, nine, 10, all the way up to 16 actions, and your simulator says, I understand, I'm, I'm nailing all of them. So at this point, the robot knows that it has a pretty good description of self. So now we pause this first evolutionary algorithm, which is evolving populations of simulators, and turn on a second evolutionary algorithm, which is going to evolve controllers on that simulator. This is what that second evolutionary algorithm comes up with. Works pretty well in simulation. And as you, we saw this video already, this one happens to transfer pretty well to reality. Which is strange because usually we don't cross the reality gap and the simulator is clearly not a perfect reflection of the robot. Some of the four legs are still bent. It's not a perfect representation of reality. But it is a representation that was built on reality. It was built using 16 experiences from this robot. If you look carefully at this physical robot, you'll realize that it's not perfectly radially symmetric. There's a battery in there, so the weight is slightly off center in this physical robot, and the legs are bent. The bending of the legs, which is what evolution had control over, is a way for evolution to approximate the mass distribution of the robot. We didn't give evolution the opportunity to play with the mass distribution on the robot, but evolution, because she's a great exploiter, is exploiting what we gave her to best approximate the physics of this robot. Okay, that's why we were able to cross the reality gap now. We're gonna continue this experiment. So the robot now has a simulator that works and a controller that works. We now torture our poor robot here. We separate off the lower part of the right leg. And remember, the robot doesn't have a camera, has no pain receptors, so it doesn't know what's happened. The only thing this robot knows is now when it moves, it gets different sensor data than it did when it moved that way before. So the only thing this robot knows at this point in time is that something has changed. So if you're the physical robot, what do you do? Re-evolve the simulator. Okay. So the robot knows. Okay. It knows at this point, it says, as far as I know, I'm a four-legged, radially symmetric robot, but I now have this 17th experience, which doesn't, isn't explained by, uh, isn't explained by the simulator. So I'm going to continue collecting experiences. It actually hits on the right idea, loses that idea, briefly toys with the idea that its leg has shrunk. <laughs> which holds up for a couple of cycles and is gradually outweighed by additional experiences and comes back to the fact that it's a three and a half legged robot. So I forgot to mention, it can put these pieces together, it can also resize them. We put that in there to allow the robot to play around with mass distribution. This is why, we, why this was called the Dreaming Robots Project, right? This robot sits here and comes up with these crazy ideas which kind of match reality, but kind of not. Eventually it says, okay, I get it, I'm a three and a half legged robot. Now we have a new simulator. So we pause the first evolutionary algorithm, which is evolving populations of simulators, unpause the second evolutionary algorithm, which is evolving populations of controllers. The original controller that worked perfectly well for the four legged robot suddenly has very low fitness, right? That controller was sitting on a fitness peak in the fitness landscape, but now, because the simulator is different, the shape of the fitness landscape has changed. What was formerly a controller sitting on the top of a fitness hill is a controller that is sitting in the bottom of a fitness valley. Controller that worked for the four-legged robot does not work for the three-and-a-half-legged robot, so the second evolutionary algorithm has to start climbing uh, the slope again and eventually comes up with, oops, comes up with this.
You remember our discussion about perverse instantiation? So we evolved this robot to get from the left side of the table to the right side of the table, which is exactly what it did. And in this case, it does it by walking in a semicircle, right? Not quite what we had in mind, but good enough for this project. Okay, so now it takes that new controller evolved on the new simulator and tries it out in reality. And you get this poor creature here. It's dragging its separated motor behind it. So we mechanically separated it from the body, but left it dangling along. Okay. So not only can we cross the reality gap, but when things change, in this case, when the robot's own body changes, it's able to adapt and carry on. Okay. I think we'll leave things there for today. Uh, you have a quiz due tonight. Undergrads, you're working on assignment nine. I will see you all on Thursday. Thank you.